Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're so happy to have you here. My name is Emily Choi. I am the COO of Coinbase. We're so proud to have this event here, so thank you for coming. Uh, so wanted to say a few words about our theme to kick this off. So the, the theme here is economic freedom. Um, and you're going to hear this term a lot tonight. And economic freedom is the ability for someone to control her labor or her property. And unfortunately, over the past 25 years, that has only increased 3%. So we, we want to do better than that, and that's one of the reasons we're having this event. So positively, um, economic freedom is positively correlated with things like life expectancy, literacy, and happiness, and negatively correlated with infant mortality, corruption, and war. Coinbase and Angels are actively working to increase economic freedom for women. And at Coinbase, our vision is a world with economic freedom for every person in business. Crypto is a side door into economic freedom for women and disadvantaged groups because it is hyper accessible. And the mission of Angels is to get more women onto cap tables of successful startups because that is the path to wealth and power in Silicon Valley. So as women, we're taught that sometimes talking about money is crass, but I think all of us here believe that wealth creation is important and it's an important topic for us to, to discuss here. Um, and so that's what we're here to talk about tonight. So we're really excited. So I wanted to introduce our panel, Rachel Horowitz, the amazing head of Marcoms and Design at Coinbase. Woo! Woo! Um, Katie Jacob Stanton, who is doing something amazing that she is going to reveal to us in coming days, weeks, months. Um, she's had an incredible career um, at Twitter and Color Genomics, amongst other places. Um, Jessica Verrilli, who is general partner at Google Ventures. Um, she, too, is part of Angels and uh, another great alumni of, of Twitter. We have Suna, um, who is the co-founder of Token Daily. I'm sure a lot of you read her stuff. She's amazing. And then we have um, Elena Natalinsky, who is the co-founder and CEO of Beanstalk Network. So we, we have an incredible crew here tonight, and we're excited to get dig in. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> Emily is also incredible, and we're really lucky to have her as our COO. So thank you, and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you all for coming out. It's super important for Coinbase to engage in a conversation consistently um, with lots of communities, frankly, about cryptocurrency and how we think that contributes to economic freedom. Um, but but really uh, a, a general conversation about this and a general conversation about uh, with women and, and, and other communities around why, they, why you should um, kind of get involved and get interested in, um, in all of these topics. So thank you guys for being here and having this conversation with us. We'll, we'll keep it kind of quick. I'll open it up for questions. But let's just go down the line. I know Emily did um, an intro of all of you, but I'd still like to go down, starting with Katie, to talk about... I think for all of us, um, or some of us, we've started in consumer tech, we've started in technology. Um, what led you to finance, whatever your role is, or crypto? Um, and why is this general theme around economic freedom sort of interesting to you and compelling to you? We'll start with you, Katie. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so my background is I actually um, thought I was going to work in nonprofit um, very early on in my career. And I noticed this common theme with many nonprofits that everyone list, listened to the bankers, everyone listened to Wall Street. And I thought that was kind of weird, kind of annoying, um, but realized that I was lacking that vernacular and I was lacking that credibility. So I actually went into finance and I was a banker for three years and um, it was pretty soulless and I didn't love it. But um, when the internet was just kind of sprouting and emerging, um, I saw the power of access to financial information as something that was really revolutionary. I was on a trading floor, I had a Bloomberg terminal, but I was a privileged few, and that's how the markets work, right? Only a privileged few get access to this information. And I thought, how interesting would it be to work on a platform like Yahoo at the time to deliver financial information and financial content to allow anyone be a, to be a great investor. So that became my path in finance and building Yahoo Finance and I built Google Finance and it was really interesting. And then when I saw the emergence of crypto in the very early stages and probably still now, barely understood it, like that's so like it's changing so fast, but realized this is just like another way for people to participate in an economy um, that is going to revolutionize the way that we do business and I wanted to be part of it. 
That is amazing. And a fun fact, I worked at Google when Katie was leading uh, Google Finance, and I was like a 24-year-old PR person who got to work with her a couple times and staff some interviews, but she didn't remember. But then we worked together at Twitter. <laughs> <sighs> how times change, Katie Stanton. Okay. <laughs> Elena, how did you get into crypto? Um, yeah, so I was a software engineer at Airbnb, and like in 2017, when crypto was just kind of starting to be in the popular light, and I thought it was like, such an incredible idea that like you can actually have full autonomy over your own funds. You could have your wealth be stored in this thing that doesn't is not tied to any government, um, and it's not very often that you get to see like this technological shift in your lifetime. And that to me seemed like you know the verge of something pretty big. And so I started getting more into it. And it's kind of like a brain virus. Like once you start being interested in crypto, it's you know you just go down the rabbit hole and you kind of can't get out. And so that's kind of what happened to me. And I started getting more into the Ethereum community and eventually decided, okay, like this is something I want to you know dedicate full time full time on. So got it. And Jess, your journey from you know uh, uh, tech startups to um, Google Ventures, but also angels and everything you guys have learned and you guys have been really outspoken about the, the cap table and getting more women involved there. So how did you get passionate about this industry and this kind of subject matter in finance? So my role at Twitter for a long time uh, was on the corporate development team and I would spend my time meeting with founders and trying to figure out what's new, what's emerging. And frankly, the ideas and the imagination of everything going on in crypto is just incredibly intellectually captivating. If you're willing to kind of work through a little bit of the veneer of the frenzy around it and you get down to the ideas, this is like economics and law and governance and math and it's in software. And it's, it's just it's incredible. Um, so I think I was intellectually captivated by it. Um, uh, through meeting people in the community, many of whom are here tonight or on this stage, um, that are building products in this space. I think the other aspect that resonated for me, having built my career in Silicon Valley, one thing we saw at Hashtag Angels up close is that being an owner matters. And we developed this thesis when there was a conversation around diversity and inclusion growing in the industry. And we saw all these companies putting out diversity stats that focused on representation in the workforce, what percentage of the company was women, for example. We found ourselves asking, maybe women are 30% of the labor workforce, but like, what percentage of the cap table are they? Because we want to know, like, our are these different communities represented in the ownership structure of the business? And we developed a thesis around like that is the number we should be tracking because when we get to parity or equality or like real representation in the economic distribution of wealth and wealth creation and property ownership, like that's what we're aiming for. And um, if you care about that, you have to care about crypto because crypto has all of these elements of why can't everyone have some element of ownership in what they can, how they contribute to these networks? You know, and, and for some people, maybe that's labor. For some people, that's content. For some people, who knows? Like these networks have different as aspects in terms of how they're built. And why, why can't everyone be a part of that? And so for me, it, I, I look at the conversations that are swirling in Silicon Valley. And even when you talk about things like, why can't contractors be equity holders in these businesses or whatnot? And you can find people in the crypto community trying to build solutions that enable a different future. So for me, it's, it's kind of all connected, and I think I intellectually fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And that's the, another fun tip is when I was thinking about joining Coinbase, the person I could call literally late at night, at like 9 o'clock at night, was Jess to geek out about crypto crypto and get really excited about it, especially after we'd both spent most of our careers in consumer tech. Um, so it was a really interesting paradigm shift to me as well, and, and Jess and I both were super inspired by that. Suna, will you share your journey into crypto? Yeah, definitely. Um, so a lot of it resonates with um, what you all have said as well. 
Um, I was at the University of Michigan. I was studying engineering there, and a lot of the developers, a lot of the engineers were already in Bitcoin. It had been on Reddit. Um, you know, they were trading it. I remember we would have arguments, very heated debates about, um, you know, will Bitcoin be the future? And I remember thinking, oh no, the government will never allow it. And, uh, you know, I've changed my position since. Um, and uh, I, I bought a little, didn't really... Uh, engage with um, the community outside of the engineering community at college, went to work at a data, data cataloging startup, um, Alation, uh, which was pretty early on, it was like the 20th employee there. And as we were growing, um, we like, grew to over 100 people, and I remembered that, I, I just recalled like in my spare time, I would be um, you know, guiding people, advising them on, uh, not advising, guiding them regarding what resources they should tap into to learn more about cryptocurrencies. And I realized that I was becoming um, the resident expert um, and that people really didn't know what was going on. Uh, Kristen Stone, who you guys may know, also had a uh, group where she had, you know, like people like Meltem Demirers and Linda Shea and Elizabeth Stark, and we would all talk about market trends and what was going on. And I realized it was you know, we had all of this information, but a lot of people didn't have access to that or have access to those conversations. So I launched Token Daily as a way to democratize that information and that access to information so people could understand who are, you know, the high integrity builders in this space. Who should I be looking at? What should I be reading about? And um, we also have a fund now where we've actually been investing in projects that um, we've been researching and writing about to let people know more about. So amazing group we've gathered tonight to have this conversation. Um, let's start with, uh, I think in finance, so w we all got on the phone and we brainstormed sort of the, the topics we wanted to talk about tonight. And I think uh, something that came up that I'm super interested in and I pay a lot of attention to is when we talk about economic freedom and we talk about um, bringing more, bringing down barriers, bringing more women into these opportunities, you can kind of have a t conversation about you know, women here in America and in Silicon Valley, and um, uh, how do we get them more access to things like the cap table, more opportunities for ownership, and what has held, what has been the blocker there, and what is um, contributing to so much inequity um, from that perspective? And then there's sort of like the global picture for women who are disproportionately have a harder time accessing financial services than others. So I, I'd wonder if first um, Angels folks can speak to kind of the finance 1.0 issue here in Silicon Valley. And then I think um, if uh, you guys from our Cryptoverse can talk about um, the way crypto can solve these issues more broadly and more globally for the rest of women. So Katie, I don't know if you want to start with that. Sure. Um, with Hashtag Angels, one of the observations we had is that the path to wealth creation, there are really four paths. You could be a founder, you could be an executive, you could be an early engineer, or you could be a board member in an early, you know, at a very early stage. And as you kind of like double clicked on each of those four paths, it kind of revealed the same persona. <laughs> it, 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 almost every single case, it was a white guy. And um, we were like, where are all the women? Where are all the people of color? And as you dug into the cap table and you understood those stats, you're like, man, like there, is a, there are a lot of people missing from that economy. And what can we do at least on the cap table to help demystify it and at least open up and share our learnings along the way? Um, and so things like you know, building these events or, and talking to people and asking founders, who's on your cap table? Um, do you have diversity? And it's one thing to have diversity you know, as founders and other things, but this was something that we felt that we could be uniquely helpful with and helpful for and ourselves learning along the way. But there, there is is so much scaffolding around these financial institutions that prevent more and more people to participate. So, for example, um, if you haven't invested and been an angel before in some of these companies, you know, part of the, the scaffolding is, are you an accredited investor? What does that mean? Do you have a million dollars? Doesn't mean that you're like you're smart enough to do. It just means like, do you have that kind of um, that capital to be able to deploy? And of course, that rules out most normal people. So you see these smaller circles. And so for us, it's like, how do we kind of break out some of that scaffolding? How do we demystify and how do we allow more people to participate? I love that. Jess, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think the other dynamic in Silicon Valley. Um, 
this used to be a very small um, sort of boutique ecosystem of financing for private companies, venture capital, like a cottage industry. Um, fast forward to today, this is the financial market that every single person in the world wants to get into. But yet, the private markets are still governed by this like informal s sort of fraternal network of like relationships. And you're like, that's how the most sophisticated ecosystem on the planet works. Like it's like, I'm just gonna call my friends and see if they want in the deal. Um, and so if you zoom out, I believe, um, I believe it was probably obvious, pick your company, Coinbase or any other amazing company. I bet you there were people who saw early on, like, this is amazing, this product works, this is going to be valuable, I, I believe in it, I know it, I've got that differentiated knowledge, but they just didn't have access. They didn't live in this one zip code. They weren't like best friends with the VC that led the deal. You know, they, they, they weren't in this community. And so if we think um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to work within the system, knowing that like these relationship networks matter. So let's diversify those. Let's bring new people into these communities. Let's like force a conversation around this. Let's, let's do what we can to try to diversify the existing networks that still hold a lot of influence for access. But you all are part of this broader story, which is like, let's just build a whole new system. Let's let a bunch of people in around the world globally to participate in the ownership part of creating these companies. And so we think both are really important, and we're part of what we do with our time and our energy is try to influence where we can within the existing system. But I think um, there's another narrative here around what you all are doing, which is super compelling. So Suna, talk about that whole new system and how you think it may tear down all that scaffolding globally to uh, help more people in general participate, um, but definitely women, because we know for some reason um, women are, are left out of a lot of this globally. Yeah, uh, that's an excellent point. Um, you know, if you're looking at this industry and you want to take on agency, you think, well, you know, I have the internet, I'll just educate myself, I'll be smart enough to get these gigs, and then you quickly realize that, you know, there's a lot more insider knowledge going on that um, no matter how far you get, um, it will just be incredibly tough to navigate that. So the way um, is specifically cryptocurrencies are able to change this is by um, opening up that access and knocking down that barrier. Oftentimes when we think people don't have money, we think that they don't know how to make money, um, like Jess was saying, but often it's just because they don't have access to the services that will allow them to process payments, to store revenue, to you know just bank their actual wealth, right? And with um, the advent of Bitcoin, yes, a lot of women in um, different regions of the world who cannot um, get KYC'd without you know, a male figure um, are able to do it independently and get paid for their services, and that's great. But I think even more importantly, they are able to employ other women and pay them in Bitcoin and create that uh, flywheel of, uh, of wealth, which is very important. And Elena, how do you think about crypto as a force for um, more opportunity for more people, in particular women? Yeah, I mean, to second all the points, um, you're able to basically open a bank account from whatever device you have because you have this digital wallet. Um, what, we're, what, what we're working on is actually privacy. So if you're going to be saying, you're, if you're going to be taking the stance of like, we're going to be helping minorities actually, you know, protect their own wealth and actually bank, um, privacy is actually extremely important, right? If you, you actually want to protect those people and actually hide those amounts. Um, for those of you who don't know, Bitcoin and Ethereum are actually all public. And so you would actually be exposing those people to other risk um, by paying them in a very transparent way. Um, but to also kind of mimic uh, uh, your point, um, regardless of kind of like the questionable ethics of what we've seen with ICOs uh, that were happening with Ethereum, one of the more powerful things that crypto has brought to us is a different way to invest. Um, so now you're able to invest in like small businesses or small projects or you know companies or projects way before IPO, and so you're able to basically bring a different kind of funding mechanism, both to projects who don't have who you know uh, wouldn't have access to that before, and likewise bringing in like new investors. So I think that's pretty powerful. 
So Emily kicked off by talking about this idea that um, I think we're taught as women, especially here in the United States, but certainly globally, I, I don't know, talking about money and talking about um, banking or wealth creation is sort of crass or tacky, um, or you're in it for, you're in something for the wrong reasons if you're talking about uh, you know, owning a piece or, or um, thinking about your own um, economic mobility and, and your own wealth creation personally. Um, so can you guys talk a little bit about, A, why you think that is, B, I'm personally um, optimistic. I think this is changing fast. Just working at Coinbase, I've never talked this bluntly about money and wealth creation. This is an old joke, but my team... I, I say, like, I'm bullish, and I talk about being liquid all the time. I'm like, I'm bullish on those snacks. So we're using all the lingo all the time. But within these walls, we're having these super dynamic conversations. And I realize um, I've never spoken this way at any other company um, and in an environment. And I'm just getting even more outspoken about these themes in my life. I, I find when I'm out talking to other moms who are brilliant and have brilliant careers, and they say, I don't understand this crypto thing, and um, we start talking about it, they get really inspired, but then you realize we're having a conversation about investing and money and the future of money. So that's kind of my experience, and I find myself breaking through whatever bias I had on myself um, or I've been taught. But what do you guys find in your daily lives? I'm also super curious from crypto folks. Um, you know, I think when you dig into crypto, it is um, the, the, the most in some of the most intelligent voices, the influencers, the people shaping the space are brilliant women. And I think you don't get that from afar if you just look at headlines and uh, about crypto. Um, so I, I think that's a kind of interesting side of the industry. But I, I'd, I'd love each of your thoughts on this theme about this conversation for women and, and breaking through some of those taboos. We're going to keep starting with me. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think talking about money and talking about finance, it's just a muscle. And you just have to use it. And you have to keep using it so it stays strong. And if you don't use it, it's going to get all flabby. And I know for me, like, as when I was a manager at Twitter, I would always notice the women on my team would largely not negotiate for raises or different comp. And the men would always come in and be like, I need a raise, I need to be promoted, and here's why. And it just, it would, I'm generalizing, but it was a very, very common, repetitive pattern. And it happened on teams around the world. And I would coach my, my women on the team, like, you need to ask for more, you need to ask for more. Meanwhile, I would barely do it myself. And um, so I noticed that, and, and I do see that changing, which is great. And, um, and professionally now, I'm in the process of fundraising for a new thing, and found myself too, like, oh, I feel so crass to ask my friends for money and like talking to investors. And I had to just change my mindset. Like I'm not like asking for donations or charity. Like I'm asking for someone to back me so I can work so hard to make them money and make a difference that I want to see in the world that they align with. And so I found myself like once I got into that pattern and I realized like this is the outcome I want to solve for and it's not hard and it's important. And now I see my daughters who are like, I need money, here's why. Like my daughter who was an intern for me for one day, she's like, I think I should have a new title. I think I should be not just like assistant, I should be like chief of staff. And I was like, oh my God, like, like boy, I taught her too hard. But anyway, so I do see things changing, but it is a muscle and we just have to keep using it. I love that, Lena. Yeah, so one of the realizations I have come to is that um, a lot of my friends who were well off were actually well off because of equity and investments and less so about base salary. That took me a while to understand. And then when I started asking my friends, like, oh, like, how is it that you have, like, X amount? And they'd be like, oh, I invested in, like, Amazon, like, five years ago. And I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so that to me, and that, like, when I started digging more into it, uh, yeah, like I've come to, to realize that you need to kind of go for asymmetrical opportunities. So people who have joined startups very early on or people who have invested or people who have taken risks, maybe invested in crypto early on. Um, and I, yeah, and I think like women just typically don't do that. And I'm not sure if that's because we're taught to be more conservative or, me, or be more safe. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've never actually thought of investing seriously until I started kind of hearing those numbers from my friends and that kind of like blew my mind away of like, oh, like I'm actually supposed to be asking for more equity and maybe care less about the base, <laughs> um, which is like completely reverse of what you've been taught to think. Um, Jess, that's actually an interesting 
uh, twist on, on for you is risk. So it's one thing, more conversation with more women. How did you yourself get comfortable with the language of finance, the language of investing? But then as you think about, you know, as a venture capitalist, how do you think about risk and risk tolerance? What has being an investor taught you about that? What do you think more women should know about that type of analysis? I think one thing to remember is the concepts around equity at startups and even financing companies in terms of how much they're raising at what valuation, there's a lot of terminology that's used. This is true for Wall Street too. Um, there's a lot of terminology that's used that in fact, the concepts are extremely basic, but they're masked with language that is meant to intimidate people and meant people to feel like this isn't accessible. You don't really know what we're talking about. Um, I would frequently, um, my prior job, be acquiring companies and I'd sit across the table from a founder, oftentimes an engineer, and we would negotiate the purchase price of the acquisition and a bunch of other terms. Um, and I always felt like it was my job to try to create an equal playing field in terms of just knowledge because we're not trying to like pull a fast one over someone. You know, we're trying to create a shared sense of trust, agree on terms that were fair, um, and we had some framework for how we would assess value, they would have a framework, and we wanted both pe parties to feel, feel like that was done fairly and create a lot of alignment for a really great long-term partnership. And um, I would oftentimes remind folks, like if you're an engineer, any role that you have inside of the company, the knowledge that you have and the concepts you've mastered are so much more complicated than like venture math. But venture math is just masked in terminology. Like they're raising, you know, 10 on 35 and blah, 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 blah. Like this is just like addition, but it's just masked in like, um, in, in, in terms that are not, not designed to make people feel like they're invited to that conversation. So. For me, I was fortunate early in my career, the very first job I had out of college, um, I was an associate at a venture firm. I like hustled my way into that job. And that meant at age like 21, I was sitting around a table with a bunch of folks who were very senior in their career, very experienced, and I just got to hear the conversation. And to me, I was, for me, I was able to sort of normalize and be in the room and just pick up on that. Um, and then for most of my career, I've been in rooms and conversations about money. Uh, and so for me, that's part of what, what made me comfortable. I would just encourage people, this can be learned. This can 100% be learned. You can read about it. You can show up um, in forums online. You can join investment clubs. You also, if you're not in a position to be investing your own money yet, because that's also a privilege to have disposable income, when I first joined Twitter, like I wasn't angel investing in startups. I had a bunch of student debt. Like that wasn't available to me. But nonetheless, I followed, I followed trends and I was curious and I was learning and I was just trying to put myself in those communities even though I couldn't play the game yet. Um, so I just think it's, it's, worth, it's worth repeating. If, if this feels intimidating to you, um, it's not your fault. A lot of that stuff was designed to exclude people and it is actually quite simple concepts. Um, compared to what you all do for your day jobs. Um, before I get to Suna, so I want to open it up for questions. I'll keep the conversation going, but you can line up at the microphone we have in the middle there. Anytime, if you have a question, I'll call you out. Um, so Suna, uh, I think, talk about crypto a little bit. And um, I don't know, as an industry, again, I think from afar, when I was thinking about joining Coinbase, I think it could be a little bit alienating, the messages... Um, at a glance on the surface, it can seem not friendly to women, period, much less a, a community where anyone who's intellectually curious is welcome. Anyone, these are complicated technical and financial um, concepts, but really anyone can read the, the Bitcoin white paper um, a couple of times and start to understand what was special about that, what was a breakthrough about that. Um, so how do you think about bringing more different types of people, period, women in particular, into crypto? Um, and how do you feel about the space in general? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. To, to start, before I get into the crypto stuff, um, well, the reason, if we think about why is it crass to talk about money specifically for women, um, there's like two ideas you need to entertain first before you get to the heart of it. And the first one is that 
uh, inherently, our society has kind of a negative relationship with money. Um, if you are concerned about money or thinking about money, you probably don't care about your friends as much or people as much or you're greedy or you don't spend time with um, you know, the things that matter. And then you look at what are stereotypically traits that are attributed to women. So let that marinate for a second. And then think about the traits that women are celebrated for, you know, being really kind, smiling more, et cetera. So then if you take this concept of you know, money is evil, there are, you know, evil millionaires portrayed in media and movies, and then you take what women are celebrated for being a people person, it seems like there's a cognitive dissonance between pursuing something that is supposed to be um, contradictory to, you know, a relation, a family relationships. What you have to think about is it actually helps you, right? It gives you more time and energy to invest in your relationships, and there are more passive ways to make income as opposed to active ways of making in income, and that's why ownership matters. Um, the older forms of making money were high salaries and the newer generation, because startups are um, easier to start with the advent of the internet, people make their wealth off of ownership. So when you think about that, crypto begins making more sense. All of a sudden, you've dropped the barrier to being able to own these assets. You're not founder swapping or swapping in secondaries. Um, you don't need to be an accredited investor. You can buy the, um, you can buy Bitcoin, you can buy projects that you, you can buy tokens that you believe in and you can, um, you know, just really own, own that actual wealth. And then also having skin in the game incentivizes you, as Jess was saying, um, into staying around those kinds of communities. And you start picking up on language that other people use that, okay, you have to do a quick Google search, but all of a sudden you'll know what they're talking about. And, you know, and so that way, you know, you can learn about basis points or inverted yield curves or whatever, um, whatever it is that people are talking about uh, in a financial context. I read Twitter for like 15 minutes yesterday and now I know what an inverted yield curve is, Suna. Proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> Got it all from Twitter. That's a perfect place to get financial knowledge, everyone. Um, okay, the, finan the financial final question here before we break in party is, so I think we've all had this conversation um, around whether it's VC and cap tables and getting equity and as women fighting for equity, I have a similar story. Um, the CEO um, at Twitter, Dick Coslow, I think I vented to him like, my base salary should be way bigger. It was way bigger before I got here. And he was like, you need to exit, come back and yell at me about equity. And I was like, got it. I need more equity in this company. So it was a good lesson. Um, but uh, I think, so for crypto for sure, I think we are at the start, we have this opportunity. It combines themes like STEM and tech and it combines finance, and it feels a little scary to me that we can repeat the problems with the last 30 years of wealth creation related to both tech and finance um, in terms of who gets to benefit from that wave. So on the crypto side, I think all of us believe we're at the very start of that curve, and people should have skin in the game, people should get involved with intellectual skin in the game. I think in terms of Silicon Valley, where do you guys think we are in terms of correcting mistakes of the past? And I guess ensuring the next 20 years of Silicon Valley, the winners are more diverse. Um, so Jess, let's start with you on that and then we should talk crypto as well. I'm of two minds. On one hand, we actually at Hashtag Angels did a big study to get some data to try to wrap our heads around this. And we partnered with Carta and they looked at the cap tables of thousands of companies representing 185,000 employees. We were only able to look at gender, so it's not a perfect data set because race and ethnicity is a really important part of this conversation, as is non-binary gender. But the data we had suggested that women represent um, a little over 30% of these companies and hold just 9% of the equity value. So that's our pipeline of IPOs. So if we think about what wealth creation is going to look like, who those folks are that are going to benefit and have all these resources to bootstrap companies and start their VC firms, it's pretty sober. We're so much further back than actually the diversity stats suggest. So on one hand, I'm like, that, that's alarming. <laughs> on the other hand, 
like look at this room and look at all the incredible experiences I now have really frequently every week with like women come in to pitch me companies and they're freaking amazing. And they are like, these companies are going public. Like these are incredible breakout uni on their way to being unicorn companies if they're not already. Um, you know, Katie and I and the rest of our hashtag angels group, we're on text every day talking about companies that excite us or deals that we're seeing or whatnot. There's just an incredible momentum and cultural shift going on right now. So I am, I'm both like sober about how bad it actually is, um, but also optimistic about what I can feel in terms of a cultural shift and, and momentum. Elena, do you wanna speak to the, the crypto opportunity? Um, yeah, so for crypto, IPO, quote unquote, is kind of a project going mainnet, meaning that it's you know public to, to everyone. And so we've seen Ethereum go public or uh, go mainnet, and then Bitcoin, you know, it didn't have what's called a pre-mine, but there were a lot of people that got really health, that got really wealthy uh, very early on, and same for Ethereum. And the thing that that happened with the ecosystem is that the people that got wealthy off of Ethereum actually started creating ecosystems for other crypto projects. So Ethereum basically, you know, was responsible for many, many, many more projects and companies and organizations to exist. And so that's actually like a really cool consequence of um, having that like wealth creation kind of be spread out in the community. Um, and that's basically how I got in as well. So like I'm, you know, very grateful for that. Um, yeah. So it looks like we have one, do we have a question? Yeah, do you wanna say yes. your name? Hi, my name is Jennifer Lay Jowett, and uh, thank you for sharing your kick-ass stories. <laughs> um, the question I do have is, how did you get more comfortable of finance and the risks that comes with it? Suna, do you want to talk about that first for you? Yeah, so how did we get more comfortable with finance and the risk that comes with it, with like investing and joining startups, or in what regard? Um, just in terms of building this wealth, like um, I guess the whole theme tonight is economic freedom and it's not quite as accessible to everybody. And there is this um, negative connotation for women to not talk about, I'm sorry if I, you can't hear me, to not talk about uh, finances. So it's hard to bring that up in a conversation all at, at a table with women. But how did you get over the risk yeah, absolutely. So I think the first place to start and what's different this time around, um, you know, versus the tech boom versus early days of Wall Street is uh, the internet is a great equalizer. Um, it doesn't go 100%, but it does help significantly. So starting with resources online, certain forums. Um, I know we joke about financial Twitter, but there are great experts on financial Twitter if you find them. No, yeah, legit, there are. It's legitimate. And, and, you know, every time you come across a term you don't know, like basis points, looking up what that means, oftentimes you'll find it means almost nothing and is very trivial and actually means, you know, one point out of 100. But it doesn't matter because you're using the lingo, not because it's a complicated term, but to show that you're an insider, right? And I think that's the, that's the best place to start. Um, getting comfortable with risk uh, in general, like nothing in life is guaranteed. Um, we hear plenty of stories about people who, you know, didn't join uh, Facebook or didn't join Twitter or didn't join um, Uber because they wanted to continue with their high management job at this big firm only to be fired, you know, months later because of an economic downturn or something that happened. Like, I think the riskiest thing you could do is um, not try, right? And to continue and grow comfortable and complacent, um, especially when the opportunities, like Elena said, are asymmetric. Any other questions? Otherwise, I think we're gonna wrap up. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>